SMUD is the nation's sixth largest community-owned electric service provider with almost a budget of $1.5 billion. In 2014, the company named Arlen Orchard as its new CEO and general manager. In our partnership with the American Leadership Forum, he joins me next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Arlen, SMUD has been going through some pretty dynamic changes over the last few years. You've rebranded SMUD. It's in a lot of different fields that weren't uh, typically associated with it. It seems that this is not my father's electrical service provider. What's new about SMUD? So really, what's new about SMUD is first you need to step back and look what's new in the industry. And the industry is going through transformational change, much like the telecom industry did 20, 30 years ago. And it's really being driven by um, certain things, uh, increasingly sophisticated customer expectations, Customers expect near real-time information now, new technology. Um, people like to call it disruptive. I hate that term. I think it's an opportunity. Um, things like solar storage is remaking it. Um, big data. Um, everybody's dealing with big data today. Um, we have um, a huge amount of big data now. Now it's trying to figure out how do you use it to the benefit of our customers and our community. Our, electro our electrical provider has big data. What, what can you do with whatever data you're collecting? So um, between 2011 and 2014, we made an investment of about $300 million into smart technologies, including smart meters. Smart for us, that means we've gone from having 12 pieces of information about customers to a year to 35,000 pieces of information about their electric usage. That also means that we know a lot about how you use your electricity now, which means applying analytics to that information, again with third party information we're now um, bringing into the company, is um, going to allow us to provide a really customized experience for our customers and really personalize the offerings that we have. For example, if we um, can determine through the analytics that maybe you have um, you know, old lighting, incandescent lighting, or a um, older vintage um, air conditioning, we can target energy saving programs to you to help you save energy and um, lower, lower your cost of energy and also benefit the environment. Well, you talk about save energy, lower my costs, and it does help the environment. So recently there was a, a, a report that a major energy provider nationally was had to report their earnings and they're down because of the fact that people are conserving energy using less of it and so therefore the utility provider is making less money and so it almost seems like the typical incentives for a business in the energy industry are going like cross purposes help us understand yeah. what's going on it does seem counterintuitive because uh, you're actually asking your customers to use less of your product which in some ways doesn't make sense, but clearly California is the bellwether for this because we have the most um, aggressive building standards in the nation around um, uh, energy efficiency and also the utilities, especially SMUD, have been um, the leaders in rolling out energy efficiency programs. So we have a lot more customers than we did 10 years ago, but our sales are flat. And so, uh, flat's the new growth for us. I think flat is the new is the new is the new way of doing business, and um, flat and potentially um, declining over time. We actually saw a decline during the recession in the amount of our of sales that we make. So, really, it is about looking as an industry. We've been based on selling electrons. In the future, as you start to think about it, 
um, again, being able to utilize um, big analytics and you start to look at what other services can I provide to my customers that will create a revenue stream to us. So for certain customers, um, you might be offering enhanced reliability if it's, if it's a hospital or and it's for that you can um, call some additional revenue associated with that. The other side of the decline in revenue is quite frankly um, the proliferation of rooftop solar. Um, we haven't been hit as hard as other utilities basically because our rates are um, among the lowest in the state so the economic um, proposition isn't quite as good but we're still seeing a huge amount of rooftop solar. Well, is, is, does that mean that energy providers like SMUD ultimately are not going to be focused quite as intently on energy generation as the core business as they have historically? I think given the transformational change the industry is going through, utilities are going to have to do a lot of soul searching and figure out where do they fit in this new in this new future and what is their business model going to be. And I think for some utilities they may choose to just be a poles and wires company. Um, SMUD is really focused on um, the other end of the spectrum which is to be a customer service and products company, which means we need to broaden how we look at it. It doesn't mean that we're going to abandon the concepts of generation, but we're going to reshape how we think of that. I don't think you're going to see SMUD or um, other utilities, quite frankly, building large-scale power plants anymore. I think the future is much more distributed. It's smaller. Um, it, it's locating solar in key areas where it will benefit your system. It's coupling things like solar with, with storage that, where the price is coming down and the technology is improving every day. Um, those investments are very different than what utilities have done in the, in, in the past. It also means utilities need to start to be very innovative in how they provide those services and think about your customers more, more from a niche standpoint than um, you know, thinking of all of your residential customers as kind of one group. So for example, um, solar, we have customers who are very interested in solar, we're a big supporter of solar. Um, rooftop solar is one alternative for customers. Another alternative that we're going to be expanding quite a bit is uh, the concept of community solar through our solar shares. And that is essentially SMUD will um, build a solar field somewhere from you know maybe 10 megawatts or something. We've got one that we've started out at Rancho Seco that should be done by the end of next year. And customers will essentially be able to buy into a piece of that solar field. And so they'll get credit for the solar generated in that, and they'll have a different pricing mechanism associated with that solar. That solar price for us will be essentially fixed for 20 years. So for the energy component associated with the solar for that customer, we can fix their price for a 20-year period. It, had, it helps them partially hedge against future rate increases, it gets them the um, benefits of being would that, more renewable Would only source. commercial cu customers use that or is there no. a residential application? Quite frankly, our, our current program is mostly devoted to residential customers and it was fully subscribed right away. It's a small program, but we're looking at expanding um, by quite a bit over the next several years because I think there's a demand there. Um, I also think um, the, the larger scale solar gives you an opportunity to provide meaningful alternatives to customers over rooftop solar. There's a lot of, you know, Sacramento's the city of trees. Um, there's a lot of customers who can't put solar on their roof without cutting down all their trees. We wouldn't want, want to see that happen. Let me go in a, in a different direction. So a couple years ago, there was a lot of talk, a lot of excitement uh, around the, the time of the recession and then in the uh, stimulus Act, mm -hmm. grants put out for doing things related to alternative energy, solar, things like that. And so one of the one of the big areas of, to use a pun, energy in that area was rooftop solar, mm -hmm. particularly for residential. But there were other folks who were on the financing end who really took the position, and these were like, you know, another aspect of the government, Department of Energy is promoting this stuff. The Federal Housing Finance Agency, which secured most of the mortgages in the country, was against it. And their point was, you can do a lot more good, particularly in residential, by uns doing unsexy things, insulation, wiring, uh, new windows, things like that. 
and that the solar and things like solar don't provide as much leverageable bang for the buck as some of these more low-tech things. Do you have a, a reaction to that? You know, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that um, the most, from an environmental standpoint, energy efficiency is the best. You don't have to, you know, it's the, it's the electron you never have to generate, whether it's through solar or whether through it's a gas-fired uh, power plant. Um, and that probably is, in, customers, if I were to advise them, and we do advise them, invest in energy efficiency first. Change out your incandescent bulbs for LEDs. You're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck and the biggest savings. But you can't ignore the f fact that a lot of customers, nonetheless, want solar. So it's how do you fulfill that customer need? Um, and so you, you offer programs that provide alternatives because customers want choices and you want to provide them choices. At the same time, you want to provide them really good information so they make informed choices. But not everyone makes choices based purely on economics. So um, these alternatives, these choices out there, are you seeing any sort of divergence between what's more attractive to different populations? So for instance, if we're in you know, either commercial or middle class communities, they gravitate towards solar. Is it the case that in lower income communities or older neighborhoods that they have to gravitate more toward energy efficiency because of the cost related to those things? Yeah, I mean, I think solar is, um, while it is, the price of solar has come down dramatically over the years, it's still an expensive alternative for people. And so you tend to see people who are in middle class, upper middle class neighborhoods who invest in solar, and that's whether they buy it or they lease it. Um, it's a different proposition for um, low income people, many of whom don't own their homes. So, and then you deal with a kind of one of the, uh, a landlord tenant issue. So for those customers, energy efficiency is the best option, and we focus a lot of our energy efficiency um, programs to those populations because quite frankly it provides the greatest benefit to them and it also provides the biggest benefit to, to SMUD and the rest of its um, customers. Let's talk about another area where you know energy providers like yourself are, are, are in the minds of company, the big oil companies sticking your nose in places you shouldn't be. Cars, trucks, yes. fleets, things like that. And so you know uh, a lot of people love the Tesla. Uh, you know, there's the Volt, there are other uh, cars on the market. And uh, there's been now even the introduction of, uh, the beginning of the introduction of hydrogen vehicles and things like that. Where is SMUD at on the uh, energy, alternative energy space related to vehicles? So we're a big supporter of electric vehicles for a couple of reasons. The practical reason is that's new load for us. So we talked about the fact that we have declining load. This actually provides a benefit to us. It also helps from a system standpoint because we often have excess capacity at night. So if we can get people to charge at night, we're actually making more efficient use of our existing resources. Um, the other thing is, and this is a big part of the, the governor's uh, low carbon future push is, you have to address, uh, to address carbon in this state, you have to address the transportation fleet. And so we're a big supporter of electric vehicles. We have started um, in making some investments. We've been actually one of the earliest utilities in the nation um, to support electric transportation. And so we are now um, in the process of um, installing several um, fast charging stations um, in the area. We have one at our headquarters building. We're um, working on another one um, at the Amtrak station, um, places where the community can benefit from that. And we're having internal discussions about what's our future play in electric transportation. Uh, there is a little bit of a challenge. There's still a fair amount of range anxiety. So the discussion we're having is range anxiety, range anxiety about <laughs> electric vehicles. You know, the Volt's 100 miles. Right. For most people, that's fine. But, you know, the, the Tesla's roughly 300 miles, which provides a little that's more. That's the energy term for performance anxiety. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a blue pill joke in there somewhere that I won't make. <laughs> So we're actually looking um, at what's our play in charging, in charging technology. So are we going to um, make a big investment in that and kind of build it and they will come to encourage more electric transportation. So we're in those discussions right now internally trying to figure it out. You know, I wanna go back to the beginning. Tell us, where is it that we get 
our power from that SMUD provides us within this region? Where does it come from? Sure. Um, SMUD has a, a variety, a diverse portfolio of resources. Probably the crown jewel is our hydro production, which is in the um, Upper American River, um, which is, if you go up Highway 50, um, you will see us off the course. We have recreational f facilities up there. That's about a 680 megawatt, um, all clean energy, carbon free energy. We have some very hyper, uh, super efficient gas fire generation that is all located within um, Sacramento County. Um, we have uh, wind, we own wind out in um, Solano County and uh, about 230 megawatts of wind out there. Uh, we have some solar and then we do a lot of contracting with renewable providers to, for their output. What about coal? Re recently, uh, the president announced some plans on really tightening things down on the coal industry, particularly because of its contribution to climate change indicators. Does SMUD draw any of its contract energy from coal? No, and in fact, California several years ago, always leading the way in this, um, prohibited utilities from contracting for coal. I didn't know that. Several years ago. Um, SMUD's, coal's never been a part of SMUD's portfolio. We've never um, had partial ownership in a uh, power plant, in a, in a coal plant. So our portfolio right now is roughly 50% carbon free. Um, so we're doing pretty darn good from a climate standpoint. So I want to take you way back, okay? Mm -hmm. As a longtime Sacramentan, um, you know, my family, when we would go out for picnics, sometimes we'd end up at Rancho Seco Park. And, you know, there was the, the whole issue about the decommissioning of Rancho Seco, and that was an interesting time in, in you know, SMUD history. Um, nuclear, um, has sometimes there it ebbs and flows. Sometimes there is talk that we, we will never go back to nuclear. Other times there are people who say, you know, if we could just get off the dime with getting the regulatory morass of California out of the way, this is a clean and safe way to really build capacity for energy generation. What's SMUD's position been on you that? Know, I, I, th I don't think that we're going to see any nuclear in California anytime soon. Um, in fact, there's actually a law currently that prohibits new nuclear power in California until there's a final storage solution, which the federal government will probably never arrive at. Um, I think California in the wet West is blessed with a lot of renewable energy. So I think that becomes the substitute. Um, nuclear power is still um, an important part. The president has recognized it as an important part of addressing climate change. There are parts of the country that don't have the benefit, as many opportunities for renewables like the Southeast as um, the West does. And so you are seeing nuclear power built there. You're seeing some innovation around nuclear power, around smaller scale nuclear power plants. They're very expensive. Um, it takes a long time to build it. Um, I do question um, going forward um, how feasible those are, given how dynamic, how much, how dynamic the industry is, um, as to whether you can ins ensure that you're going to recover your costs over the life of you the project. You talked about the hydroelectric mm -hmm. plant you have up on the American River. Mm -hmm. That's the jewel in the crown. Climate change and the drought that we're dealing with right now. Does that at all threaten its generation capabilities? It, it certainly does. We are very dependent on snowpack up there. If you think about it, snowpack essentially serves as a giant battery. It releases a little bit of water at a time and we run it through our plants and generate. Um, when you have a year like this where we had, I think it was five to 7% of the historic snowpack, even though precipitation was like 50% of normal, uh, it, it dramatically reduces our ability to generate um, clean hydro um, energy. So we end up having to carefully manage the system, hold back as much water as we can in the system for the summer when um, is kind of our busiest time from a sales standpoint, obviously the climate here. Um, so, but over the course of the year, we're dramatically down from where we normally are from the amount of hydro generation. Well, you know, talking about hydro and water, uh, the governor, or someone in the administration came out with this new campaign that brown is the new green, right? <laughs> and so in my own neighborhood, you know, it's brown lawns 
for days, right? No one has a green lawn anymore. When you look at the community you reside and work in and you travel, because I know you travel extensively, is there any doubt in your mind that climate change is real? No, I, I think climate change is the probably the greatest environmental threat we're facing right now. And I think it's quite frankly, I think the, the science is clear on it. Um, so no, I'm a, I'm a big believer in climate change and I'm a big believer that we have to move to a low carbon um, future. And I think um, utilities in California are clearly leading the way in that effort. Well, which brings us to the effect. We are feeling the effects. Effects are being felt throughout the country. Massive floods in some areas. Our manifestation out west is, is this horrific drought. It also affects another aspect uh, of our existence, which is our economy and our competitiveness. When uh, climate change does impact everything from if, if you're not getting enough snowpack to generate power, it creates dislocations which potentially affect commerce. You and a number of other CEOs have joined together in a new organization called Greater Sacramento. And its purpose is to really dive deep and create a concentrated approach to growing the economy and prosperity in this region. Why is SMUD involved in that? So step back and think about SMUD. We're a community-owned business. The community owns us. So part of our mission is to make sure that we don't have shareholders. Our mission is to make sure that we're creating a very strong value proposition for our customers and the communities um, that we serve. So economic development is part of our charge, quite frankly. And um, to some degree, if you're looking at it from a practical standpoint, a growing economy here benefits us financially, obviously. But making a more vibrant um, community is just part of who we are. So we're very interested and very supportive of anything we can do to grow the economy and diversify the economy. Um, Sacramento was um, hurt very much by the recession. We all felt um, the impacts of it. Sacramento was hit harder than many places, even in the state of California. So I think it's kind of a wake up call that we need to think differently about our economy going forward. And I think you understand that it may be more volatile in the future. So we need to figure out how to smooth that volatility out. So the approach that the CEOs and this organization is, is taken as a bit different. It's data focused. Yes. I know that you like big data. I love big data. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, a question that, that always pops into my mind whenever I fly back to Sacramento from Washington, D.C. is if you look at Washington, D.C. and Sacramento, and I had a conversation with the CEO of Greater Sacramento, Barry Broom, on this, but I, I'd like to get your take. Washington, D.C., 25, 30 years ago, was a lot like Sacramento in, in terms of its economic vitality. But it's been transformed. It has some of the highest incomes in the country, highest educational attainment levels, and it's got a very robust for-profit private sector of headquarters companies or major beachheads for major international and national companies. And they did that by capturing, not only having commerce that ha was unrelated to the government, but a lot that was commerce that was related to the government where they had a bucket to catch some of the cash that comes into the federal treasury and then cycles back out through the states. It seems that Sacramento, we have a next economy plan and there, there's for-profit sector parts that we can leverage and build on, but it seems that we, in running away from being this, the capital of this nation state called California, we don't focus on having a bigger bucket. Why is that? You know, I don't know. I think it's, it's, a, it's a little bit that we've never focused on it, I think, as a, as a you know, it's, it's, we don't have a good brand. That's part of what Greater Sacramento is charged to do, is creating a brand. We have done an abysmal job of selling the region. Um, I think, Quite frankly, it's, it is kind of shocking that California, the capital of California, the seventh largest economy in the world, uh, where most of the, a lot of the cutting edge government that is thinking that is going on is happening right here in Sacramento, we should be a hotbed of think tanks. 
and we're not. And out of things like think tanks come young entrepreneurs, comes a creative class. We have not developed that. We're starting to, I think, and I think that kind of focus will um, be part of what Greater Sacramento focuses on, looking at what can we leverage. We've got a world-class um, university, um, one of the finest universities in the world with UC Davis. Um, I think UC Davis has typically faced um, towards San Francisco in its view. I think the new chancellor who's on the board of Greater Sacramento has a very different view and, and understands the need to be integrated in um, into the Sacramento community and looking for ways to actually unleash the commercial potential of, of um, UC Davis. Sac State is a great resource and it too has started to look more, more to be integrated into the Sacramento community. So I think we're on the right path. Why we're not there, why it's taken so long, I don't know. To be continued, thank you. And that's our show. Thanks to our guest and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax, see you next time right here on KVIE. Five Star Bank community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.